طيب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The Pledge of Allegiance to, to him um, One thing I didn't mention when we spoke about Abu Bakr radiallahu an is that what is the meaning of the word bay'ah The word bay'atun. If you look at the word bay'atun, it comes from the word bay'ah. Right? You with me? What is bay'ah? Bay is business, buying and selling. And bay'ah is a pledge of allegiance. Now, there isn't one English word that totally gives you a one word that you, you can just use for bay'ah. You have to say it's a pledge. And you also have to word, me, mention the word allegiance, right? Type. So, pledge of allegiance. What is the similarity between the word bay'ah and the word bay'ah? Meaning that they both become binding. And they are both, uh, they are both, uh, give, give, just give me your hand, right? This is how you take bay'ah. You either put your hand on the hand of the person you are taking bay'ah with, or you hold his hand like this, and you say, I pledge allegiance to you, to obey you, to, to listen to you, and to fight with you, etc., etc. That's how allegiance is taken. The king of Saudi Arabia still does that, or at least when he, was, when he became the king, he took the pledge of allegiance from the leaders of the tribes of Saudi Arabia in that way. Governors, um, chieftains, etc., etc. I don't know if other Arab, do, do you know if the, the Yemeni president did that? Yeah, he ordered the, the leaders of the tribes to come to Sana'a and pledge allegiance to him. No, but anyway, the word bay'ah. Also, what is also important for us to realize is that bay'ah is specific to the political leader of the Muslims. Bay'ah is not to be taken at the hands of a Sufi sheikh or a sheikh or anyone. Why? Because it involves obedience, right? Um, clear obedience to that person. So we don't take bay'ah to a Sufi sheikh. Why? Because he has no authority over us. We give a pledge of allegiance to the leader. Why? Because he protects us. He takes the care of the affairs of the Muslim, of the Muslim land. He makes sure that every, you know, all the laws of Allah are implemented. And my Sufi Sheikh or a Sufi Sheikh he will not be able to do any of this. Right? So the, the, the use of the ahadith that say, whoever dies without having pledged allegiance dies the death of someone from Jahiliyyah only applies to the one who has a leader, a political, you know, uh, like the, the Khalifa, and he refuses to pledge allegiance to that person. We are not talking here, you cannot use this. In the same way that Jamaat al-Tabligh should not use the ahadith about fi sabilillah and the ayat about fi sabilillah and apply it to Jamaat al-Tabligh. Right? Why? Why is it wrong? It's not wrong because Tariq Appleby said it's wrong. It's wrong for other reasons. It is, it is incorrect. Can you repeat the question, Sheikh? I missed you. The, the, what, the, the, what's I, was I asking you a question or making a statement? I'm confused now. Too much coffee. Too much donuts. Yeah, too much donuts. Yeah. I, you know, I only had three. Don't judge me. I saw some people have five, you know. But we're not going to point them out. They know who they are. Um... The point I want to make was that Jamaat al-Tabligh, Sufi orders, right? Let's talk about bay'ah first. Bay'ah cannot be given to a Sufi sheikh because all instances of bay'ah in the time of the Prophet and the Khulafa and all of them until the end of the, of the Ottoman Empire were all given to the political leader, the highest office in the Muslim world, right? The Khalifa, the, you know, the king, whatever it might have been. So... Those uh, from a historic point of view, from an Islamic point of view, bay'ah has always been given to, to the main leader, right? The highest leader. That's point number one. So we cannot use those ahadith that speak about bay'ah. We cannot use them for people who have no political power, right? That's, that's point number one. Point number two, in Jamaat al-Tabligh, and I used to be in Jamaat al-Tabligh for uh, more than one year before I went to Medina, Right? Um, you find that they use ayat in the Quran and ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to prove why you need to go out for three days and 40 days and four months and one year, etc, etc. 
Now, why can't you use that? Because in some cases it can work for you and in other cases it can't. And one of the signs of an incorrect you know, methodology or belief or ideology is when you find inconsistencies in it. Because a hadith that speak about the person who guards, they would use a hadith like this. Whoever guards the borders of the Muslims and dies, dies as a martyr. Right? They use that to say that the one who guards the cause while the program is, con is happening in the masjid, that, that, that hadith applies to that man. It doesn't. What will they do with the hadith that says that the one who dies in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll come on the day of Qiyamah and the blood will have the, the, there will be the color of blood but the smell of musk. Are you with me? Those ahadith. What about those ayat that says, يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَيَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ In Surah Tawbah, Allah says, they fight in the, they go out in the path of Allah, they fight, they kill, and they are killed. You can't use that now for Jamaat al-Tabliq, because there is no fighting in Jamaat al-Tabliq. Right? No, that isn't even encouraged. Politics is not encouraged. Jihad is never spoken about in the sense of actual physical warfare. Right? None of those things. So when you start to see inconsistencies in the ideology, when it cannot be applied to all of the texts, this is something. Um, one point I want to make, those of you that I've taught before, maybe you remember this. We said that the hallmark, the sign of Ahlu Sunnah, is that they first study and then they believe and they come to conclusions. And the hallmark of the people of innovation is that they first believe and then they try to support those beliefs with verses and with a hadith, right? Very, very common, uh, you know, uh, approach. Um, I was talking to my Pakistani friends, you know, last night, and I was talking about the concept of Hazir and Nazir. Very common amongst, you know, uh, what do they, uh, we call them? The followers of Ahmad Raza Khan, the Baralvis, right? The Sunnis as they call themselves, right? Amongst them, it's very common, they believe in the concept of the Prophet being Hazir, meaning he's present now, he's always, he's ever present, and he is nazir, meaning he sees everything, right? The Prophet is a witness over everything. Now this belief has no basis in the Quran and the Sunnah. It was never taught by the Prophet. It was never taught by his companions. So how do they support it? They say, well, think about this. If I told you that a man's watching on a big screen, he's watching the tawaf, right? He's watching people making tawaf in Makkah. And then he sees someone being killed, Right there by the Kaaba. Question, can he be a witness at that criminal case? If you're sitting in Malaysia, watching someone get killed in Makkah, can you be a witness at that person's trial? No. So he says, now turn to, to Surah An-Nisa, where Allah says, وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا And we will bring you, O Muhammad, as a witness over these people. So the Prophet can only be a witness if he sees everything and he's with his Ummah all the time. You understand? But what the Sahaba understood from this verse was that the Prophet ﷺ will be asked the question, Hal Have you conveyed the message to your people? That is how, what it means that we will, you will be brought, O Muhammad, as a witness over these people. The question will be put to you on the day of resurrection. O Muhammad, you were sent to the people. Did you convey the message to the people? And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say, Ya Rabbi, I did. I conveyed what you revealed. I fulfilled my mission. That is what the ayah means and how the sahaba understood it. They did not understand that the Prophet had all of these superpowers that are now being attributed to him much later. You know, wallahi, this concept was, was, uh, was innovated by a man from India from northern India, from a place close to Lucknow, what other cities are close there? Dioband, you know, Baralvi, they're all in that same area, right? Delhi, and the same in uh, Uttar Pradesh. Has anyone been to India before? Anyone? Show of hands, quickly. You've been to India, lovely. So how do you like it there? Did you have masala dosa? Yes, you had? Good, huh? Shall I miss masala dosa? Well, I have no idea. My, my, my six-year-old son misses it. This Abi, he reminds me, he tells me, Abi, you remember when we used to go in the mornings before school, we'd go to the restaurant. Unfortunately, the restaurant had a big statue of Ganesha. 
right? But they made the best masala dosa right there. But let's continue, inshallah. Okay, where are my notes? So that's the Pledge of Allegiance, and I just wanted to explain that, clarify certain things. He consulted with higher-ranking companions and questioned them about Umar. But he had already made up his mind that Umar is going to be... I mean, I wouldn't say made up his mind, but rather I would say in his heart he knew that Umar should be the next Khalifa. Right? Abu, Abu Bakr radiallahu an is on his deathbed. He knew all along because he heard those ahadith of the Prophet where the Prophet said... That if you don't find me, if I'm no longer here, then go to Abu Bakr and Umar. And Ali radiallahu an, when he becomes Khalifa and the people are criticizing Umar and, 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 and Abu Bakr, he says to them, you know, Wallahi, how many times did I hear the Prophet say, I went, myself, Abu Bakr and Umar. We came, myself, Abu Bakr and Umar. We left, myself, Abu Bakr and Umar. What is Ali trying to prove to the people? How close? Who's? Is that yours? No? Is that yours? You know, you know my policy, right? Of confiscating phones. You remember when we were in Penang? And I said, oh, no, it wasn't Penang. It was my first time in, Mal here, here in KL, right? And I tell students, if your phone goes off in the class, that phone belongs to me, right? So three sessions go by, mashallah, no, no phones go on, and their phone rings. And I'm like, oh Allah, please let it be an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell the brother, I tell him, it was a Nigerian brother, right? I tell the brother, bring your phone here, right? And it's an iPhone. <laughs> you know, I tell the people, well, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not in Wali of Allah, you know, just, uh, just happened to be. Then I left, uh, no, that was the next year. I came to, to Penang, taught the course, and I flew to, to India, right? So I'm in India, in Bangalore. And I make the same announcement that I always make at the beginning of a course. No, put your cell phones off. Don't put them on silent, etc. If your phone rings, it's mine. And like a, a whole day goes by. So we get like after Asr. And this guy just walked in and his phone rings. Right? He just came to pick up his wife, his children, I think. And his phone rings, right? And so I'm like, oh Allah, please let it be a Blackberry torch. Because they just had, you know, they just came out. And uh, the guy brought his phone and it was a Blackberry torch. And I said, Ya Allah, you know, I, I shouldn't be making dua for these things anymore. I should be making dua for other things. Now, he consulted with high-ranking companions and questioned them about Umar. So, he asked them, what do you think of Umar? Is Umar the, you know, what do you think? Is he a good, a good candidate to become the Khalifa? Obviously, everyone thought so, right? They all thought. When they were asked while Abu Bakr was alive, they asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, like, would you, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, we as the companions, we always had it at the back of our minds that when my father dies, Umar is going to be his successor. Right? Aisha. Aisha radiallahu anha. She said about her father, Abu Bakr, you know, that while he was Khalifa, we had it in our minds that Umar would be his, his successor. Okay? So what happened after he had, he had decided on Umar, he wrote a decree, he read it to the people, what did it say? This is a decree which I, Abu Bakr, on my last hour in this world, and my first hour in the next, set forth a time when even a disbeliever begins to believe, a transgressor takes heed. Ya Allah, this concept, you know, like I said, that theme, that common theme in all of his discussions, all of his books, was that you are not going to be in this world forever. Abu Bakr was, was, you know, was very staunch and, 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 and very particular about this, this mindset. That this life is temporary. Are you prepared or are you preparing for the next one? Always concentrating on, you know, and getting the people to have that same attitude regarding that matter. What does he say? I've appointed Umar ibn Khattab as Khalifa after me. Listen to him and obey him. What then happened was that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, the people placed allegiance to him in the masjid and he then wrote to the governors of the different provinces ordering them to take the Pledge of Allegiance for him as well from the people. So what does that mean? And if I take the Pledge of Allegiance for you, if you are the Khalifa, right, and I am, let's say uh, you are in Malaysia and I'm in Pakistan and you're the Khalifa here, yeah, you know, this is your capital, so I'm your governor there, I call the people to the, to the masjid or, to the, or, or to, to the headquarters of the governor and I tell them that Umar has been appointed in Malaysia and everyone should pledge allegiance to him here yeah? 
people will come one by one or in groups or sometimes, and this is the most effective way, is when their leaders come. Like if you are from one tribe and you are the, you are the chief, instead of all thou, the, you know, all thou, 1,000 people coming, we just bring representatives and they pledge allegiance on behalf of, this is what happened where? In the seerah. This happened in the seerah where a few people pledged allegiance on behalf of many. Give me examples. Yeah, in the sea, I said the seerah, that was the clue. But I'm, giving, I'm looking for, 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 for actual, actual stories, events. Yes, at Aqaba, it was before the Hijrah. And then also in the year of the delegations, people came, people, the, you know, the, the elite of, of most of the tribes of Arabia, they came to Medina in the eighth year or the ninth year, and they came to pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ on behalf of their tribes. Obviously, it wasn't, it wasn't practical for the Prophet or for the Muslims to expect that the entire tribe comes from Yemen to Medina to pledge allegiance, right? We just need the leaders to do so. And that is sufficient. What was his method of governing? Or rather, how was he going to govern? He points some of this out when he gives the following inaugural address or speech. He says, O oh people, ya ayyuhan nas, sa'ad'u fa'aminu. I'll make dua. And then you say, Amin after my, my dua. He said, O oh Allah, I am harsh. Now he knew that. So, uh, radiallahu anhu. He knew. He knew what kind of person he was. And that's important for us to realize we need to know who we are. What kind of personality we have. Right? What parts of our personality we would like to improve. So what is he making dua for? He says, oh Allah, I'm harsh. So make me soft. But don't make me soft, you know, just soft for the sake of being soft. Make me soft for the people of your obedience. For the people who obey you. Make me soft and merciful and kind towards those people, the Muslims, in agreement with the truth, seeking your face and the next abode. And give me severity, give me harshness, right? That harshness that I have, let me use it against your enemies. People of sin and hypocrisy without oppression and transgression. Now that's important. Why is that important? Those last two words. Why? Why is it important that even if these people are my enemies, oh Allah, don't make me one who transgresses and oppresses them. They are your enemies, they are our enemies, right? I want you to make me harsh against these people. I want you to make me someone who shows them no mercy, but without being a transgressor and an oppressor. What does that mean? Is it raining? And the sun is shining. Oh, it's the cooling system. I'm afraid it's not working. <laughs> right, yes. Let me give you a practical example. The Prophet ﷺ, when he sent out the, 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 the armies, what did he tell them? Don't kill the women, don't kill the children, don't burn the crops, you know, don't kill the people's animals. Don't kill the people who are worshipping the, you know, the, 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 the rabbis and the monks, etc. So even though those people are from our enemies, it, it doesn't mean that we now oppress them by destroying their wealth, by killing their women and their children, and we say, no, you know, this is, uh, this is from the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Omar is saying there's a big difference between being severe on the battlefield and between killing innocent people, Right? And that brings us to another issue which uh, Anwar Awlaki, since we spoke about him yesterday, let's bring it up now. He says that Allah says in the Quran that if they transgress against you, they transgress against them. Right? Surah Al-Baqarah, second Jews. That, you know, um, if they transgress against you, transgress against them. So if they kill our civilians, we can kill their civilians. That's his argument. But this is not, this is not, uh, not correct. The Quraysh killed many of the Prophet ﷺ's civilian companions, but yet the Prophet ﷺ never went to the, you know, he never, when he conquered Makkah, did he kill the people? He only killed, they only fought against and killed those who resisted and those who fought against the Muslim, the Muslim army on that day. So we need to understand that. Also when the Prophet ﷺ went to other places, he didn't kill the women and children. He didn't kill 
the, the civilians. He didn't say, ah, you know, these people are like them. They are from them, so therefore they also deserve to be killed. This, again, is a... What's the word I'm looking for? It's a one-sided, you know, one, a, 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 a one... Um, what's the word I'm looking for, man? Subhanallah. One dimensional, you know, analysis of the seerah. It only takes into account one thing. You have one verse and you read the whole seerah out of, out of context because of one verse that you, because of your emotions, right? You've been overwhelmed. Wallahi, let us not misunderstand um, what I'm saying. Obviously, when you see Palestinians and Syrians being killed, people in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they are being, you know, they are being uh, tortured and, and mutilated in, in prisons and they are being bombed and they are being, you know, um, the women are being raped and the children are being killed and you see the babies and how they've been shot and burnt. You know, obviously that, if you don't feel anything, then we have no iman, right? If you don't feel anything for your Muslim brothers and sisters, if we don't, then we have no real faith because we need to, you know, like we are one body. If one part of the body feels pain, the whole body feels pain and fever, right? But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we become oppressors ourselves. You understand? doesn't mean that we become oppressors. Well, we are better than that. So that's why the Prophet said, don't mutilate the bodies. So even if they mutilated the bodies of our soldiers, we don't do the same to them. Because if you take what Anwar Awlaki is saying, that, you know, that um, if they transgress against you, then transgress against them. Then what if they rape our women? Can we rape their women? And we all agree that we can't. Right? So there's a, there, are, there are limits. And the limits are set forth in our rules of engagement for jihad. Right? And we spoke about some of them as we went along. Taib, oh Allah, indeed I am stingy, so make me generous. Now, why is he stingy? He thinks that he is stingy. So he's asking Allah to make him generous. Why must Allah make him generous now? Only now that he's become Khalifa is he saying, make me generous. Because as the Khalifa, he will be expected to distribute the wealth of the Ummah. Right? And he will also be expected to spend on many projects. And he will not, you know, he's not in a position to have, to be a person who is unwilling to spend money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we all know that he's not that person. In all the difficult ways of doing good, and the most difficult way of doing good is jihad. And jihad requires the most money. As you can see, America spends how much billion dollars a year on their armies? How much does Malaysia spend on its army? How much? You have, you have an army? Do you have a navy? Yes, you should have a navy. You have, a lot, you, have, you have islands and coasts, right? What else do you have? So how much do you spend? How much does Pakistan spend on their army every year? Lots of money, I know. Because of India, they spend a lot of money on their army, on their planes especially, and on their garrisons on the border in Kashmir and with India. Am I right? right? Anyway, that's a different topic. Let's rather move on. Because I can talk about those things all day. Right. Without being extravagant or wasteful or showing off and make me seek your face in the next abode in all of that. Oh Allah, grant me humility and gentleness towards the believers. Very quickly, what we learn from this is, number one, that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu is going to be um, gentle with the believers now, severe against the kuffar. He's going to base his, um, his khilafah on very much the same principles as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. There is going to be jihad. There is going to be fighting. There will be equal distribution of wealth. It's maybe not for the, for the first part of his khilafah, but later, right? There is also going to be a concerted effort on the part of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an to make sure that money is spent on the most important projects in, in the Muslim world. Right. What are his most important contributions? How much time do we have left? 40 minutes? Right. Excellent. So, number one, he establishes records and offices for military and financial affairs. Now, when we say records... The Arabic word for that is called a diwan. Right? The word is diwan. And a diwan is something very specific to the army. What does it mean? In the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, what we now have is, what is your name? 
Tariq. Right, your name is Tariq. What a beautiful name. <laughs> right, so what do we do? What's your father's name? Muhammad. Also Muhammad. That's very confusing now. What's your grandfather's name? Don't say Abdul Malik. Right, so we have, you put your name down, Tariq Muhammad. Right? Tariq Muhammad, he's in, of, he's in the army that's going to Iraq. Right? Who's the leader of that army? It is Khalid bin Muwalid. And we are paying Tariq ibn Muhammad, al Yamani, we are paying him 200 dirhams, right, per year. Are you with me? And he is going to be in the army for four months. Are you with me? Oh, and he will be stationed, and these are the details that we now have. So now this D1 is a very accurate record of who is fighting in the path of Allah, where they are fighting, how much the treasury is paying them, when, how long they will be fighting for. Umar radiallahu anhu now systemizes the whole, the whole system, or rather the whole, um, you know, the, this, um, this written record of the army, Who's fighting, how they're fighting, when they're fighting, all of these matters. Right, that's called the D1. Also, he appoints people whose, whose sole job is to work here. Right? So what, do, what can we call this? What's a nice English word? Not accountant. Not a bookkeeper. Because we're not talking, we're not only talking about money. Money is like only one aspect here. Administration. So we call this military administration. Military administration. Type. So military administration, that's the D1. Then another thing that we have is the Baytul Mal. Right? The Baytul Mal, literally the house of money, the house of wealth. What do we call it in English? We call it the, the treasury. Right? Now, what do we, in the time of the Prophet, وسلم, a building was specified for, for, for wealth, and an area was specified for the animals that were collected for zakah. Because we don't only collect gold and silver in the Baytul Mal. Okay? And this gives an, us an opportunity to talk about some of the sources of income in a Muslim country. So let's, let's, uh, let's mention them. One, number one. Zakah, right, so zakah. What is zakah? Zakah is gold and silver. And the livestock. And agricultural produce. I'll just put produce here. Right? That's, the, that's what we're getting. So when we say about produce, we mean fruits and vegetables. But more specifically, uh, that kind of produce that can be stored. Like wheat, barley, beans, those type of things. So that's number one, gold, silver, livestock. So when I say livestock, I mean cows, goats, sheep, and camels. Number two, the jizya. What is the jizya? A tax which is, which is applied to the non-Muslims living in, under the protection of a non-Muslim, of, non, of a Muslim country, non-Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Magians living in a Muslim country. They are charged a tax on their... On a, we can call it a protection fee, if you want to, right? That, that is what they pay as a, as, as, as a way of guaranteeing their, their safety and security in a, Muslim, in a Muslim country. What else? Number three. Of one? It will fall under this here. Ah, war booty. Excellent. War booty, right? The Arabic word for that is ghanima. So war booty. And war booty is a lot, of, a lot of things. Okay, it's livestock, it's gold, it's silver, it's money, it's land, all of those things. There's a fourth source of income in a Muslim country. What else? What is it? It's called kharaj. Naam, what is kharaj? Kharaj is a land tax. And what, and Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he was the one that really systemized this by, what, what did he do? If the Muslims conquered, let's say this was all agricultural land, right? And they grew crops here. 
And the people refused to become Muslims. Not only would they pay jizya, but they would also pay a percentage of what they produced. Right? Let's say 10%. So if you produce 100 tons of um, rice every year, then you have to pay 10 tons of that rice to the Muslim, to the Muslim treasury. Okay? So it was a, a land tax based on the agricultural produce. The people were allowed to keep the farms, and they, they were allowed to keep on farming and doing what they were doing, but they had to pay a tax on, on what they had. Okay? So these are some of the ways. Obviously, we can number five, right? You can just write this down. These are the, but these are secondary sources of income. Number five would be um, voluntary money that is given to the, to the state, like sadaqah. Right? Let's say that I want to sponsor the jihad in, uh, in Asham, and I want to give a thousand camels for that. Right? That money isn't for my zakah. I've already given my zakah. This is a thousand extra camels. Right? So voluntary charity. And people ask me the question, what about taxes? There are no other taxes in Islam. If it is not zakah, if it is not kharaj, if it is not jizya, there is no such thing as income tax in Islam. There is no such thing as custom and import taxes. Um, although, in later in the Muslim world, we started introducing levies on people who were bringing goods into the Muslim world. Like, do you know that the Vikings used to bring slaves from, from Europe? The Vikings would leave Denmark, Scandinavia. They would go across Europe, like, you know, France and other places, and Spain. They would capture people from there, and they would take those slaves to the, to the Arabs. <coughs> They'll take them down the, you know, the, 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 the Volga River through Russia. And then they would um, bring them to the Caspian Sea. And then from there, they'll be transported to places like Baghdad. Did you know that? Okay, that whole issue of whether it's permissible or not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get into that now, inshallah. But it was happening. And we used to, or at least the Muslims of the time, used to charge and import tax on what was being brought, right? And that is why you will find, that is why they are still finding in Scandinavian graves of the Vikings, they are finding artifacts and, and, and produce and things that was produced in the, in the Muslim world. Because they were taking with them, you know, if they, wouldn't, they, were, they, were, if they were not taking gold and silver, they were bartering for, for those things. Anyway, that brings us to the treasury. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was able to systemize that, the treasury, and have a detailed record of all of it. Number two, he established the Hijri calendar. What is the Hijri calendar? The Hijra calendar, but what is it? Okay, this the calendar that starts with the Hijra. Yes. Okay, so Umar ibn Khattab asked the companions, what do you think? We need an Islamic calendar, a Muslim calendar, right? We can't use the Christian one because they started, they say the day that, you know, Jesus was crucified, right? When he died. So we, we can't use this. And so we need to have our own one. So when, you know, when should we, what should be the beginning of our calendar? Some Sahaba said, when the Prophet became a, a Prophet. Some said from the birth of the Prophet. Others said that when the Prophet وسلم, went on the Isra and the Mi'raj. Others said the Hijrah. Others said the Battle of Badr. Right? But then Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu thought to himself, but what was that defining moment in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And to him, the defining moment was the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to Medina. Can everyone stand? Right, now we need to have a massage. Right, so face the person on your right. Just uh, everyone face that way. Right, go for it. Where's my, where's my massage, Sheikh? Right, excellent, excellent. All right, now you need to face the other way. Right. Just go for it, go for it. Don't be shy. Excellent, excellent. Right, just over here, Sheikh, just there. Right, now 20 push-ups. I 
I only do it when I see people sleeping. You know? There's nothing more demoralizing than seeing your students sleep. <laughs> yeah, Allah, you have no idea, right? I don't care if people eat in my class, they drink in my class, even if they talk to each other, right? But if they sleep, subhanAllah, just it, it, it hurts, you know, it hurts. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. So he established the Hijri calendar. He looked at the Hijra as being the defining moment. So the Hijra became the start, right? The Prophet sallallahu died in the 11th year, right? And etc. until we are now in the year 1434, okay? That is how many years have passed since the Hijra of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So that's the Hijri calendar. The judicial system was organized under his reign. Now we can discuss in some detail what a judiciary is supposed to look like in a Muslim country, right? One of the first things we are going to realize is that judges are appointed by the Khalifa. That's the first thing you need to understand. So whether it's in the time of the Prophet or Abu Bakr or Umar or even those after them, judges are appointed by the Khalifa. Point number two, judges are independent, meaning that their decisions are final unless people want to appeal that with the Khalifa. So the Khalifa is the appeal court, the appeals court, right? What do they call them? What's a nice word for them? An appeals court. What do you call it in Malaysia? The court of appeal. What are you going to do? Right. So, so, so that's just that's a genius. <laughs> oh, I was, what happened earlier when I said, you know? No, I'll just leave it. Right. Uh, so they can appeal it, and this has happened, but um, point number three is that the judge has complete authority to implement his, his rulings. What does that mean? Today, we have separated between the two, okay? The judge gives a ruling, and then the judge has to, has to ask the police or the army to implement that, or the sheriff of the court, right? So they are like almost two, like what happens in Malaysia? Is the, let me ask you this question, the, the, pro the prosecution, right? Are they connected to the police or are they separate? Your investigative bodies, like your FBI, your separate, right? So they are separate, okay? It's the same thing in South Africa. But in the time of, of, of the Khulafa, they were not separate, right? They were not separate. The judge and the police, or rather the police, were under the judge. So the police had the authority that, you know, go out and, you know, apprehend this person. Or go out and execute that person. Or go out and return the wealth of that man. You understand? But we don't have that today. The judge gives a ruling, and it is hoped that the other bodies of the government would implement the ruling. Okay? In the past, it wasn't like that. The judge had a, had a lot more influence than he has, than he has now. Okay? Yeah, than he has now. Night patrols, we can, we'll continue now. All right? Okay, what do we mean, firstly, lastly, firstly, lastly? Right? Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit tired now. You know, my mind is... Uh, is running, uh, or rather my mental, you know, uh, uh, tank is running on empty. Um, Sheikh, yeah, uh, Sheikh Abdul Bari and I, we were up from four, right? And just talking until someone came to call us for tahajjud. So I'm really tired now, right? And I'm sure the Sheikh is having a good sleep. <laughs> right. Okay, now inshallah. So he organized it. What does that mean? It means that he appointed judges in specific cities. It means that there was a, a system was now implemented and he started you know advising the judges how do you judge you judge firstly if you find a ruling in the quran that's you you know then there's nothing else to be said if you don't find it in the quran then you look in the sunnah if you don't and what we mean by the sunnah we mean general ahadith and we also mean judgments of the prophet himself because if a similar case came to the prophet and he gave a ruling on that case, and the case that, my, that I'm dealing with now as a judge is the same, I must give the same ruling as the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes it's not the same, and obviously the ruling cannot be given, but that's why we go to the third option. One needs to look at the sources, or rather the objectives of the Sharia. What's the nice Arabic word for this? 
maqasid al sharia right the objectives and the goals of the sharia what does the sharia want in this particular case right does the sharia for instance in marriage and divorce does the sharia encourage divorce or does it discourage divorce it discourages divorce right so one of the objectives of the sharia is for people to stay married but it is not at the expense of the happiness of the couple that is why the sharia has legislated the issue of who knows not talaq there's another way of not of of, of annulling khula, right where a woman says that i don't want to be married to this man and i'm willing to give back my mahr right the mahr he gave me i'm willing to give it back now people think that there must be some very bad reason that she needs to but if you look at the very foundation of the issue of khula it's not that the woman wanted a jamila um, she was married to Thabit bin Qais. Why did she want a khula or a divorce from him? She wasn't attracted to him. Right? She wasn't attracted to him and therefore she didn't want to be married to him. And that was it. What else was there? She said to the Prophet that I don't criticize his religion or his character. Right? Listen very carefully. I don't have a problem with his, with his deen. He's a, he's a great man, a great Muslim great character gentle you know all these things but i just don't find him attractive another narration says one day she got onto the the roof of her home she looked down and she saw her husband with other men and she saw that he was the most unattractive man amongst all of them okay so what, what are you gonna do what are you gonna do well my first i remember my first counseling session <laughs> husband he looks me straight in the in the eye and he tells me sheikh I don't love her anymore. Just like that. What do, what do I do? Do I force him to stay married? He doesn't want to be with her. He doesn't love her anymore. She is also not too, you know, too enthusiastic about staying married either. Okay? I tried, you know, to get them to reconsider, but at the end of the day, you don't want people to stay miserable. Right? People shouldn't stay miserable just because they want to stay married. It's, I don't think it's right. And I've seen the, our children are, are affected by that. And the people themselves, you know, suffer depression, etc., etc. Let's move on. Right. Night patrols were established for, safe, for safety and to check on the affairs of the Muslims. What do we mean by night patrols? We mean two things. Number one, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu himself used to leave his home at night and patrol the streets of Medina. Right. And number two, he also appointed specific Muslims for that duty. So this is the beginning of the police service in the Muslim world, right? This is the beginning of that service, of, 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 uh, of that service, policing the streets, etc., making sure that they are safe, making sure that there are no thieves, etc., right? That was established in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. So, one of the, you know, subhanAllah, Umar used to, used to patrol, and he used to ask the people, is there anyone who needs anything so that I may fulfill that need? Is there anyone that has a problem that need that I can help to solve? That was the kind of, of Khalifa that he was. Today, our leaders are separated from, and I'm not just talking about political leaders. I'm talking about our principals. I'm talking about our managers, our supervisors at work. They separate themselves from the workforce. They separate themselves from the students, from the teachers, right? They separate themselves on, a, on, a high, on the highest level from their citizens. They're not connected. The people don't feel a connection to them right that's why in south africa jacob zuma from time to time no no before he became president he used to sing with the people all the time then he became president now he doesn't sing anymore right and he stopped singing because uh, all of a sudden he thinks that by becoming the president he needs to be aloof from the people separate from the people and the opposite is is, is true now that you have become the Khalifa, the people have more right to your time than before. They have more right to, you know, to, for you to come to them and ask them about their needs and, and uh, what you can do for them. Next, he left the, the conquered territories in the hands of the original owners and he taxed them. Kharaj, we spoke about that earlier. He divided the conquered territories into provinces and appointed governors to each province. Now, Abu Bakr also did this and the Prophet wasallam also did this. But one of the innovations, if I can call, I can call it that, of Abu Bakr, of Umar radiallahu anh, 
was the following. He developed a very complex postal system, which meant that he was able to keep in touch with his, with his governors. So let me just draw for you again my beautiful drawings. Wonderful, huh? Right, so Makkah, Medina. So what did he do if this was Sana'a over here? He had a postal system that he could communicate with the governor there. What was that postal system? Every few kilometers, there was a fresh stop here. And the rider would ride from Medina till he gets here. He would hand the letter over to a fresh rider who would continue to ride to the next stop. Then here, a rider, a fresh rider would get, you know, would take the letter and deliver it to, to, the, to, to, to the governor there. So he was able to communicate with the governors in Egypt, in Sham, in Iraq, and along the coast here, because he invented, not invented really, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu also had a similar system, but it wasn't as systemized as it became in the time of, of, of Umar radiallahu anhu. It really became a wonderful system during the time of Muawiyah and the Umayyad dynasty. It became so streamlined that a letter that normally would take, you know, two weeks or three weeks to get to his destination would get there in a matter of days. Now, obviously, in that time, that's like sending an SMS, right? That, that's the kind of comparison that you would have because um, if, you, if it takes a month for someone to travel from Medina to, to Damascus, then imagine if you can cover that distance in only five days. Are you with me? It's a huge saving of time, and it, it helps, obviously, during the battles with the, with the Romans and the Persians. It did help a lot. Let's move on. He ordered the establishment of towns in the conquered territories. And from those towns are two towns that are built along the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in Iraq. That is Kufa, or rather Basra first, and then Kufa. These two towns, yes, there were settlements there, but they became Muslim towns, and they were built with masajid and places for the Baytul Mal and other things, and they also had their own governors. By the way, just a quick, uh, you know, just a side benefit over here. The town of Basra was built first, right? And then Kufa. And when um, Ali radiallahu anhu, when he becomes the Khalifa, he moves the capital here from Medina for the very first time, because for the, for the first 36 years, this was the capital of the Muslims, he moves it to Kufa, and this is where his capital is. But the point I want to make here is, that there are two schools of thought, two main schools of thought in Arabic grammar. One school is called the school of Basra, and the other one is called the school of, of Kufa, right? And another way of looking at this is that the school of Basra is called the school of the majority, because it was older, right? It was older, had the first scholars of the Arabic language, and that's why you will hear when you study Arabic grammar, the Basriyun and the Kufiyun. Right? They had this opinion in Nahu, in Arabic grammar, and they had that opinion. But also, another point I want to make here regarding Kufa and Basra, is that Kufa becomes the hotbed, the headquarters of the Shi'i movement. Right? And early Shi'ism didn't have what Shi'ism today has. Right? A lot of the same kind of beliefs. But some of the extremists amongst them, as we will discuss later when we speak about Ali, they believe that Ali was God incarnate on earth. Right? The extreme amongst them. And because of this belief that they had about him, Ali radiallahu anhu had them burnt. burnt. And Kufa was known for many innovations. And Basra. Basra was known. Basra gave us the Mu'tazila. Have you heard of them? The Mu'tazila, they are a rationalist school of thought. And Kufa gave us the Shias. Right? So yes, there were a lot of good at the beginning, but after the death of the major, of the major companions, like uh, Umar and Uthman, those two cities became problematic in certain ways. Okay. Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, quickly before we go on, um, Umar radiallahu anhu also ordered, after Egypt was conquered during his reign, the city of Al-Fustat. Al-Fustat, today we call Fustat Qahira. Al-Qahira, the capital of Egypt. Right? 
Al-Qahira. This was the name give it, given to it by the Fatimiyyah, and it's still what we call it today. But during the time of the Sahaba, it was called Al-Fustat, right? Al-Fustat, that is uh, just some background history. Another town established by or under the order of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu. Yes. What about Salat al-Taraweeh? Ni'ma al-Bid'a to hadihi. Ya Allah, Shaykh, why are you killing us, man? You're killing us, right? You're really killing us with that one. Summary, Shaykh. Okay, khalas, let me, a, a summary. You know I can't do summaries. You know, I'm not very good with summaries. Anyway, Amr ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, the brother is saying that during when he's the Khalifa, he sees that the Muslims in the Masjid of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, some of them are praying here. Yeah? One of them, like a one imam, and a few guys praying. And here is a, one imam and a few guys praying. And over here, this is the month of Ramadan. And this is why, how the people are praying. He says, he looks at this, you know, at, in the masjid. And he says, you know, isn't it better if we just had all of these people just standing behind one or two imams? Right? All of these guys, they're all separate here. What we need to have is the following. One imam and the whole masjid filled with the Muslims. Right? So that's what he did. He ordered the people to stop praying like this in groups, individual groups. And he ordered Ubay ibn Ka'ab and Tamim al-Dari for them to take turns to lead the Muslims in, in prayer. Right? Now one of the things you have to realize is that in the time of the Sahaba, they never called it Taraweeh. They still called it Qiyamul Layl. And they still prayed it at the time we prayed Tahajjud this morning. So their Taraweeh was actually tahajjud, but it became taraweeh, you know, later, much later, right? That's, that's, that, that's important for us to realize, that they still prayed at the same time, and what is the basis for this? The Prophet sallallahu came out of his home one day, and he started to make salah, and people started joining him. Okay, it happened for one night, right? The next night, the Prophet came out, he was there, people came to join him. That's two nights now. The third night, people did the same, on the fourth night, the Prophet didn't come out. Then the Sahaba, they asked the Prophet, how come you never came, you never came to, to, to pray? The Prophet ﷺ said, I feared it would become compulsory for you. Right? So when Umar radiallahu anhu joins the people like this, right? And he sees them like this, and he says, oh, what, in a, what a good bid'ah this is. What is he talking about? What is, he, what is the bid'ah? You understand what I'm saying? What is he saying is a bid'ah? That's my question. I don't see the bid'ah in the Hadith. Yeah. So why is it used to, 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 to justify bid'ah? Can I sit down? Sheikh? Right. So why is it, why did he say ni'matul bid'ah to hadi? Do you know why he said it? Because from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until his time, no one had prayed it like this. Are you with me? So for him, according to him, it's a new thing. It's a new innovation. But in reality, it isn't a new innovation. It's only him now bringing it back to the, well, the way it was. Because the Prophet ﷺ died. And there's no revelation going to come down to say that taraweeh in the month of Ramadan is compulsory. There's no fear of this happening ever again. So now we can pray like this. Right? But the problem today is that the fear which the Prophet had has manifested itself in the minds of the people. What do I mean? I mean, we've gotten to the point where if you pray 8 and I pray 20, we are going to have a fight. Isn't it so? It happens in Malaysia, it happens everywhere. I remember when I was in India, it was a huge issue. Right? I told the people, you can make as many as you want. Make 50 if you want. Ya Allah. But didn't Aisha say the Prophet didn't make more than 13? I said, yes. But the Prophet also told the Bedouin man, when the man told him, Ya Rasulullah, teach me this, uh, this Qiyamul Layl, this Tahajjud that you make. The Prophet said, Mathna, Mathna. Right? You make it in twos. And if any one of you fears Fajr, then let him pray Witr. You with me? The Prophet didn't give him a number. So the Prophet, yes, he prayed 13. Right? But he never restricted people to what he, what he did. Make it in twos. That's what you need to do. Two, 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 two. Make a hundred, make two hundred. You know, you want to make two. Like this morning, we only made four. I didn't even know that the time was going like that. Did you know? Did you know the time was going that fast this morning? 
I didn't realize it, subhanAllah. I was like, it's, uh, anyway. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? So, ni'matul bid'atu hadihi, that's a totally, it's, it's, it's like, how they, what did they say? It's out of the qibla. You know, it cannot be used as evidence here because he is not establishing an innovation. This has legal, uh, uh, you know, it has le as, as a legal basis. The Prophet sallallahu had prayed in this particular, this particular way. I think we'll, st we'll stop there, inshallah. Tomorrow we'll continue with the battles of Qadisiyya, Yarmouk, and the conquest of Egypt. But if you have any questions, we'll take them now, inshallah. Did I answer your question? Right, I hope so. Was it the